Let's do try for bayonet fighters. The quick in the air! Which are you? The quick! One, two, three, two. You better get in your mind, you're going to get yourself in shape. Because you've got just about five rough weeks coming up. Five of the roughest weeks. And you're not going to make it if you don't do it. You better get out here on your own at night and run up down this street three or four times. You better start building that wind up. Because like I told you before, we're a team. We're not individuals anymore. We're a team. Fort Ord, California, sits along the coast of the Monterey Bay a little over 100 miles south of San Francisco. Millions of soldiers lived and trained in the nation's chief training center. At its peak, 50,000 troops prepared for war on the installation in a single year. Well, Fort Ord was the 7th Infantry Training Base, and uh, post-Vietnam War, uh, they redesigned these training missions to move with more with technology, and, and rather than big, huge brigades going to war, it was more light fighter. In fact, this was called the Light Fighter Training Center. And that meant that it would be a platoon of people on a helicopter who could be dropped in anywhere and carry out their mission. So the training was here, both the educational and the physical training. Uh, Fort Ward had about 35,000 people on the installation. It was actually the largest community other than Salinas at that point in time. It was big business. It was a light infantry division, so we had a lot of soldiers. And those soldiers lived in town. Uh, they may have shopped at the Commissary and PX, but they also spent a lot of money downtown. It was a very vibrant community. You know, it had its own shopping mall, it had its own sports fields and training ranges and all of that, but it was still very much a contributor to the community. On your the average age is 23. The youngest is 19. They come from city and farm, slum and mansion. And almost to a man, they would rather be somewhere else. Yet, they are here. Self-confidence is a byproduct of basic training. It takes a lot of it to learn how to kill a man. As a leading training center, Fort Ord was the first taste of Army life for many soldiers. As a deployment staging ground, it may have been a final stop before deploying to war. Fort Ord soldiers fought bravely in the major conflicts of the 20th century, including World War II, Vietnam, Korea, and many other efforts. It was also widely considered one of the most beautiful locations of any Army post. It sits along the Monterey Bay in California, known for its historic tourist destinations such as Monterey, Carmel, and Pacific Grove. The neighboring communities of Seaside and Marina were supported by the fort, which supplied thousands of civilian jobs.
In 1988, the Base Realignment and Closure Act was passed. 121 military bases were considered property in excess. Fort Ord was closed in 1994. It was the largest of them all. The city of Seaside and the city of Marina took an economic beating when Fort Ord closed. Well, Fort Ord is the largest army base yet in America to close. And it's the size of San Francisco, 28,000 acres, same size as San Francisco. When you lose a quarter of your people, you lose that much of your businesses. So there was a lot of businesses shuttered. It was a little bit of a abandoned feeling, economically and socially. So probably the worst thing that ever happened to a city marina, and it's very true for Seaside as well. The numbers were staggering. 21,000 jobs lost, 400 million in annual payroll checks and service contracts gone, 5,000 county homes and apartments vacated. But preparations were already in effect prior to closure. Suddenly you find out there's going to be 28,000 acres excess to the Army's needs. It could have been totally chaotic or it could be planned. No one had ever done this before, closed a huge military base that actually overlaid about five communities. The land was divvied up between the bordering communities, with Seaside Marina and the county receiving the most land. Monterey and Delray Oaks got slivers of land along the southern borders. Proposals immediately began spreading. Imagine an artist colony large IRS center, amusement parks. Envision resorts and a golf course along the Fort Ord dunes. The most serious proposals started a heated debate. We had a community disagreement. Uh, the greatest number of communities wanted to see a university be the centerpiece of reuse. Uh, there were other communities that wanted to see a federal prison because at that time the federal prison system was uh, expanding. Uh, There's a lot of debate about it. Uh, the folks that wanted the prison were really concerned about the people who had lost their jobs at Fort Ord and needed a job right now and a prison would have been very very quick. A university was going to take time. It became clear that the state of California was going to have to referee the decision making. The Fort Ord Reuse Authority or FORA was created by law, comprised of representatives from cities, the county, and other related institutions. Legislation established this agency to oversee planning, financing, and implementing reuse. With a piece of real estate so large, regardless of what you did, it was going to have widespread impacts for good or for bad. And as a result, all voices should be part of it. Leadership on the Monterey Peninsula came together to create the Base Reuse Plan, a vision for Fort Ord. That vision was that Fort Ord would be a keystone in the future of this community through environment, education, and economic vitality. The first of the three E's proved to be a huge success with the creation of California State University, Monterey Bay. It provided new residents, education and culture, and new jobs. It was a proud day when many years later President Clinton came here and de dedicated it as an example of really uh, changing uh, swords into, into plowshares. I, th I think we are honoring the soldiers of Fort Ord by um, doing exactly what we're doing, creating swords to plowshares with a brand new university so their children and grandchildren can come here and study in an area they studied for different purposes. Uh, the mission is training still, it's just a different kind of training. No other university in the United States has an opportunity to look out their window and see a whole new community being built for, for modern mankind. It, that the opportunities to use the conversion of Fort Ord as a learning moment, as a training moment, 
is absolutely phenomenal and rich and uh, uh, we haven't built a lot yet. There's a lot to be built and how that's built and for what purpose it's built is going to be the destiny of this universe. The base reuse plan also called for preservation of natural resources. When residents finally got access into Fort Ord, what they discovered was breathtaking. Well, Fort Ord, actually these days, is um, it's different depending on where you are. When you get out into the, um, the open space, it, pretty quickly there's a, a wilderness kind of feel, which is pretty surprising considering how close uh, it is to existing cities. And that's one of the things that's unique about Fort Ord is, is the military base probably an un, potentially an unattended consequence of operating a military facility here was it wasn't developed into large residential area. It was a military base and they needed a lot of large open terrain to pr practice their maneuver exercises and their range exercises. Because of its historic and cultural significance, beauty, and rich natural diversity, President Barack Obama designated the majority of Fort Ord a national monument. Lush grasslands, gnarled oaks, vernal wetlands, scrub-lined canyons. Rare and unusual plants, animals, and insects. And even some introduced non-natives. To have a, a national monument right here in our backyard is pretty phenomenal. Creating a, a way so that the national monument can be a real destination will help not only the environment but will actually help the economy and I think that that is a, a great potential for creating a, a lot of jobs. I think it can also be uh, a fantastic 
element of CSUMB and the other educational uh, facilities, whether it's for attracting students or attracting faculty or staff, being able to say, this is right in your backyard. This is you know, thousands and thousands of acres that you can go and use it is a great recruitment tool. Even more land will be added to the National Monument once the artillery range is cleared and cleaned. About 8,000 acres of Fort Ord had been artillery impact areas since the turn of the century. During World War II, uh, Navy ships would sit in the bay and shoot five-inch shells into Fort Ord. We had had tens and tens of thousands of soldiers train and during training ammunition is lost uh, sometimes it was easier to bury the ammunition than turn it back in um, so there was a huge amount of cleanup that needed to be done one of the first things needed is a series of very specialized firing ranges to simulate natural combat terrain the terrain is available the rest calls for some know-how commence firing Four miles of shoreline was also protected as a state park. It was a former shooting range, and many old army structures still remain, among its towering dunes. Eight hours a day, every day, will be spent with a weapon in their hand. Each man must win his own lonely duel with the target. Clear! Clear! Bound line is clear! The National Monument is unique because it is a meeting of land and sea in many places. Ecotourism is the way of the future. We all want ecotourism in our area. They come in, they stay for a few days, they spend money, and they actually try to leave the area better than when they got there. I think I could probably argue effectively if not a single additional thing happened at Fort Ord. You could describe it as a success because we have protected 18,000 acres of open space and we have created a pretty incredible university. Only problem is most of the things that have been created out there don't provide a lot of property tax. So you don't have the economic capability on the underlying jurisdictions that you hope to. And, and that's the current, the current fight. So debate still continues 20 years later about the third E of the base reuse plan, economic development. It may be one of the most contentious issues in Monterey County today. The Great Recession put a hold on many projects, so empty lots and blight remain. It seems like just when we're ready to start development out there, you have a major economic downturn and the developers can't, can't really develop. Uh, so that's been, from a cyclical point of view, that's hurt us an awful lot. We need to redevelop and to get rid of the blight, to transform the area into an economic uh, engine that can uh, provide more jobs to the local area, uh, provide a, uh, a better environment, and also provide uh, tax revenue to the land use jurisdictions and to the entire county to help everybody in this, in this dire economic uh, period, to say the least. Some pockets of success have appeared after the recovery, but what is lacking is another huge accomplishment like the University and National Monument. Almost 20 years later, thousands of acres of toxic buildings and empty lots still exist. Developers aren't exactly lining up. We have all of these old buildings that were supposed to be taken down by the developers. It's their responsibility. Um, you know, now that nothing is happening, there isn't enough money being generated to take the buildings down, and so we, we end up having a a situation where it's not very attractive. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit bleak, and so it's hard to attract more things when, when you have these um, kind of unsightly, unsafe uh, buildings. Where developers do see opportunity is a few blocks away from the university.
An unprotected stretch of forest, nearly the size of Carmel, has recently been restricted. Will it be developed or kept natural for recreation and habitat? The community is divided once again. History repeats itself. A plot of land the size of San Francisco was abandoned and gifted. The county's diverse population naturally has diverse opinions. So what plans fit the priorities, values, and vision of the Monterey Bay community? People from all over the United States have a connection with this land. All eyes are on the community to make long-term decisions, much like they did with the University and National Monument. So choices we make today could have long-run implications. So I think that's why it's good to keep in mind the long run, even as we're considering things that, that are affecting us in the short run, and focus on what we want this region to look like 20 years from now or more, uh, and what type of development, what kinds of uh, industries uh, should form the new economic base for the region. So I'm hoping that we can be uh, partners and a resource for the region in trying to think through that. I think that the voting public, the activists, are the ones who have to be the ultimate caretakers of how this base, which the federal government's taken care of for almost 100 years, is now turned over to the community and say, it's now your watch. It's for you to make what you want to make of it, and it's for you to make sure that uh, people pay attention to detail. What is best for the community? and future generations of residents, visitors, and veterans. Only the Monterey Bay community can answer that. Let's hope they think thoughtfully and long-term in this grand experiment. Will they achieve that crucial balance? Will they honor our soldiers? Will they destroy blight or contribute to it?